welcome to the Indianola First podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our prayer is that this message will inspire you, encourage you, and launch you into life-changing action. We've been in a sermon series for the entire month of January, and today we wrap it up. Uh, New Year, fresh start. New Year, fresh vision. New Year, fresh commitment. New Year, fresh expectations. And this morning, New Year, fresh fire. So when I think about that word fire in reference to my faith and what the Bible says about fire, I get a lot of pictures in my head. And there are actually many references in the Word of God to fire, the word fire. And, um, you know, we're not going to get to them all today. That's, that's probably impossible. We could do a series on that sometime that would take probably a couple months. Um, but it's a fascinating study. And I've had a lot of fun just looking up all the different references as references to fire and trying to categorize them a little bit and put them in places and, and try to understand more about this word that's used so often within the Word of God. And, of course, um, some of the references are the fire of God's protection and leading, and, and a good picture of that would be the pillar of fire by night that the Israelites had in the desert after Moses led them out of Egypt. You know, there was that pillar of fire. Can you imagine wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, but you had that pillar of fire to protect you at night? You know how a campfire does it for you? When you're out in the middle of the sticks? A pillar of fire. I mean, just right there protecting it and actually leading them. Uh, the, the fire of God's presence that caused Moses' face to shine after he experienced God's presence as a burning bush. And I think that... that uh, uh, that, that's another example of fire. That we're, we're probably not going to get to all these this morning. Um, I'll get into some ones that I want to get into. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the fiery furnace that they were thrown into. And man, they came out of that sucker and they weren't even smelling like smoke. You know, I, and, and there, was a, there was a fourth guy in there who was real shiny, right? That's what VeggieTales says. Well, we know that that was the Son of God. And um, that was Jesus himself in the midst of the flames with them. Uh, I, I think of uh, even uh, Nad, Nadab and, and, I don't know how to say his name perfectly, but Abihu, uh, they offered unauthorized or strange fire before God. And so there's that, that idea of strange fire. <laughs> I mean, there's all sorts of fires in the word of God. Um, so I'm going to hit on a few of them this morning, but let's, let's put them, like I said, into some categories, and, and maybe it will help us get our heads around uh, what desiring a fresh, fresh fire really looks like for us. Because how many want a fresh fire, a fresh touch from God? Amen? Absolutely. Uh, so the Bible uses the word fire in reference, number one, I'm, I'm, to his judgment. The one I'm going to cover today, one of them I'm going to cover today, is his judgment. The fire of judgment. And... Um, Nobody loves to talk about this, right? But it's in there. It's in the Bible, and so we can't avoid it. I, I, and when I think of the fire of judgment, I think of the flaming sword in the Garden of Eden. You know, Genesis 3.24 says, He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and, the, and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And so this flaming, fiery sword was part of the judgment pronounced on mankind after they sinned. They were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, as you know, and the sword kept them from coming back in and eating from the tree of life because if they ate from the tree of life, they'd live forever. Right? They, announce, or that, that pronouncement of judgment uh, was upon them, the, the judgment of sin. And that flaming sword kept them from going back into the garden. I also think of, uh, when I think of the fire of judgment, I think of, it's hard not to think of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Genesis 9, 19, 24 says, Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. The sin of the city was so horrific that God could no longer let its evil spread and continue. So judgment fell on them, and the Lord used literal fire from heaven to wipe them off the face of the earth. And I'm reminded of the prophet Elijah and, and the judgment on King uh, Ahaziah. <laughs> King Hehaziah had fallen ill and sent men off to inquire of Baalzebub, and that's the false god of Ekron, as to whether he would become well. So here, here's this king, and uh, he, he uh, falls ill, and he wants to know if he's going to get better. So he could call on the god of Israel, his god, his, his ancestors, right? But he doesn't. He, he sends his men off to consult this false god. 
And um, Elijah met the men that went off to do this, and he prophesied that because the king acted as if there wasn't a God in Israel, that he would surely die. The king sent for him three times, and uh, this is what happened the first and second time. This is interesting. Second Kings 1, 9 through 10. Then the king sent to him a captain of 50 men with his 50. He went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top seat. Let me explain this. I forgot to say this. The king didn't like what Elijah said. You know, you're, you're going to surely die because you consulted a false god rather than your god. So the king's like, well, I better go talk to this guy. I better send some men and bring him back. Well, then the king sent uh, to him a captain of 50 men with his 50. He went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of the hill, and he said to him, O man of God, the king says, come down. But Elijah answered the captain of 50, if I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. They were gone. I mean, boom, just like that. And so then, uh, of course, uh, the... the uh, the, the king did the same thing again, and the same thing happened. Another 50, boom, off the face of the earth, fire from heaven. And then there was a third time, and he fell on his face, and he was like, no, no please, don't, please don't let fire rain on me. The king just wants to talk to you, man. Well, we know that the king did indeed die. And of course, when we're talking about the fire of judgment, we can't forget that there's a future place of torment, a place called the lake of fire. And it's, it's in the Bible, right? You know, one of, the, one of the craziest tricks, I think, that the enemy and most effects, effective tricks of the enemy is, is to get people to believe that God is so loving that there could not be a hell. But folks, there's a hell. There's a lake of fire that burns and, and death itself will be thrown into it. The devil and his angels will be thrown into it. And also people. That's what the word of God says. In Revelation 20.10, it says, And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. It's a real place. Revelation 20.14-15 through 15 says, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. You better have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. And that happens when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. This lake of fire is the final destination and judgment place of those opposers, those enemies of God, those people that never submitted to Christ. Jude, in his letter, admonishes believers to rescue those who doubt the word of truth or the truth of the word of God, to, to rescue them from future fiery judgment. Jude says in 123, rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to, uh, to still others, but do so with great caution, having the sins that contaminate, hating, I'm sorry, the sins that contaminate their lives. So just as fire is described in the Bible as an instrument of judgment, as well as a picture of judgment, it is also used in referring to, to being refining or a refiner's fire. And obviously we're, we're, we're not gonna ask God to bring forth a fresh fire of judgment upon us. How many know that, that we wouldn't want that, right? But it's important to understand that the word fire is used throughout the Bible in reference to judgment. I mentioned the refiner's fire. That's point two, the refiner's fire. So we see the fire of judgment. It's there. It's in the word of God. We see the refiner's fire also there all throughout scripture. Refining precious metals was an art form back then. It involved heating up the metal until it liquefied. The impurities or the dross within the metal would, would rise to the top and they would skim it off and continue this process over and over. And it is said that they would do this until they could literally see their own reflection in the liquefied metal. No more dross meant that the metal was now pure. And we've sung, sung songs in the past that refer to this. Burn in me, right? Burn in me. Let the fire of the Holy One burn in me. Your words like a fire burning in my soul. Burn off the dross. Bring forth the gold. Right? That, that's, that's a great song. That's talking about the refiner's fire. God, burn within me all the impurities away so that when you look at me, you can see your own reflection. I wanna be pure before you. 
Malachi prophesied over 400 years before Jesus was born about the coming Messiah and that he would be a refiner. It says in Malachi 3, 2 through 3, but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller and, and like fuller's soap or a launderer's soap is what that means. He will sit as a refiner and, and purifier of silver and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Refiner's fire. Job equated his own suffering as a refiner's fire, a method to bring about, bring about purity. Job 23.10 says, but he knows the way that I take when he has tried me, that's what that refining process is. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. The apostle Peter alluded to trials in this life as refinement. It says in, in 1 Peter 1.7, it says, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, through, or though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Refiner's fire. And, and, and church, it can be a dangerous prayer. I get it. God refined me. Put me through the fire until you see your reflection when you look at me. It's not a prayer that we often pray, is it? God, do whatever it takes so I can be pure before you. Do whatever it takes to burn away the dross. Put me through whatever you have to put me through. If it's trials in this life, I think most of us have enough of them, we don't have to pray for them, right? But to let those trials become purifying in our life is a wonderful thing. And, and let me just say that you will never understand a prayer like that unless you see his kingdom as more important than the kingdom we often try to build for ourselves. When his kingdom and building his kingdom becomes more important than building your own kingdom, then having a prayer of, God, refine me, do whatever it takes. I wanna be a reflection of you. That prayer makes sense, but it's a difficult prayer to pray if you're so busy building your own kingdom that, and, and building his kingdom is secondary. To know that refining trials in this life are evidence of his love for us, not that he inflicts hardships on us for some sinister purpose, I'm not saying that, but if we see those hardships as the very refining fire that purifies us to the point of being Christ-like, that's when we can live out what it says in James 1, 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It's a new year. Are you willing to pray a prayer for fresh refining fire? Though it may cost you everything, you gain something even more valuable. And a conversation regarding fire and the word of God, I mean, it obviously has to include not just the fire of judgment, not just refining fire, but the fire that consumes sacrifices. And an obvious example of this is when the Israelites engaged in tabernacle worship. I think Pastor Jared alluded to that when he came up and prayed. And the, and the offerings that included fire and burning of, of specific offerings, the, the, the Mosaic law is filled with examples of this and had rules around all of it that were very significant. We don't have time to go into all that, but, but get into the word of God and study some of the, some of the stuff out. It's, it's incredible. And in addition to these planned ceremonial sacrifices being burned with fire, there are instances in the Old Testament when fire literally fell from heaven upon the offered sacrifices. David offered a sacrifice on the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. Upon Aruna trying to give David the threshing floor and the, the bulls to sacrifice, David insisted on paying for it. You might remember this in 1 Chronicles 21, 24. But King David replied to Aruna, no, I insist on paying the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. 
And 1 Chronicles 21, 26 says, David built an altar there to the Lord and sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings. And when David prayed, the Lord answered him by sending fire from heaven to burn up the offering on the altar. And that's what happened. And it was a pretty serious deal because David had sinned against the Lord. He had, in this instance, counted the people when he wasn't supposed to. He wanted to see how many people he had because he wanted to see how powerful his kingdom was. And it was God's people, not his. I think about that every time we take church attendance. Should we really do that? But he sinned against God. And God was not happy with him. And so he went and he did what he did on the, in building, building this altar and putting this thing together. Buying full price. I also think about, uh, when I think about the fire that consumes sacrifices, I think about when Solomon dedicated the temple. 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 3. I know it's a lot of scripture this morning, but there's so many references to fire. And just to get a good, solid picture, you gotta go through some of this stuff. When, when Solomon finished praying, fire flashed down from heaven and burned up the, the, the burnt offerings and sacrifices, and the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glorious presence of the Lord filled it. And when all the people of Israel saw the fire coming down and the glorious presence of the Lord filling the temple, they fell face down on the ground and worshiped and praised the Lord saying, he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Not too hard to praise God when the, when the place is on fire, right? I mean, I'm not talking about literal fire. I'm talking about spiritual fire that's, that's seen and visible. And for them, it, it was a sign that God was in the house. You know, there are stories and I don't want to freak anybody out here this morning, but there are stories that, that uh, are at the beginning of, of what is known as the Assemblies of God right now, and that's what kind of church we are. But in, at Azusa Street, there, would, there was meetings going on, and there was believers praying and crying out to God for his fire to fall upon them, not his judgment fire, but the fire of his presence just to be there, his refining fire to be there. Them as sacrifices, not necessarily burnt offerings, but living sacrifices. And they prayed, and, and people who didn't even know the Lord were, would drive near there, and, and they could see fire above the building. You say, oh, come on, that's crazy. I don't know if it was real, like in the sense of they, it was, there was real fire there, or if it was a miracle of, of just God giving them a vision, but they would call the fire department and the fire department would show up to those meetings because the fire of God was falling like that and it was visible. That's just over 100 years ago. That kind of fire falling. And again, I don't want to freak anybody out, but do you think what would happen if people drove by this church and because the people inside were crying out to God for a fresh fire to just be poured upon them, just to be dumped on them, a refining fire, a fire of God to come down. What, what, what would happen if they saw fire outside? Would they call the fire department? Whoa, something's going on in there. I tell you what, I think in the last days, there's going to be signs and wonders that follow those that believe. And it's not just about healing. Healing's a huge part of that, I think. Healings and, and miracles, but signs and wonders. I mean, if you drive by a church and the place, the roof is on fire, I mean, that gives a whole new meaning to the roof, the roof, the roof is on fire, doesn't it? <laughs> that's a whole new, that's, that's, that's a whole new meaning. But that's, a, that's gonna make people wonder, Right? I also think of, when I think of fire that consumes sacrifices, I think of when Elijah challenged Jezebel's prophets on Mount Carmel. There are about 450 prophets of Baal, and Elijah challenged them to a duel. Who, he basically said, who's ever, who, who, who's, uh, who's God is, uh, whoever's God is real, is, their, their offering would be burnt by fire from heaven. So let's, let's put it to the test. And the prophets of Baal went first and prepared the bull and wood for the sacrifice. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Then began crying out to their god, Baal, their false god, from morning until noontime. And Elijah, Elijah at noontime started making fun of him. 
He mocked them. He said, maybe he's just daydreaming or he's busy relieving himself, meaning he's out taking a leak. That's what it means. Maybe, he says, he says, maybe he's on a trip or he's asleep. And the prophets of Baal cried out even louder and cut themselves and tried to get the attention of their false god. The problem with trying to get attention of the false god is that he's false and he doesn't exist, right? So nothing, no sounds, nothing happened. Nobody heard anything because they're crying out to a non-existent entity. Elijah, of course, then, after they were done and got to be early evening, he he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins, and he he dug a trench around it. He also prepared the bull and the wood for the sacrifice. And then he had the people dump four large jars of water over the sacrifice and over the wood. And he had them do this three times. In 1 Kings, I'll pick it up, 18, 36 through 39, it says, at the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, for offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah, the prophet, walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O Lord, answer me, answer me so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. Immediately the fire of the Lord, here we go, flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull in the wood, the stones and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, what did they do? They fell face on the ground and cried out, the Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Oh, duh. (laughs) Right? I mean, it's obvious, right? The all-consuming fire upon a sacrifice brought multitudes back to God. It, it, it may not seem very applicable to us today, but as I talk about one more type of, that, of fire that's in the Bible, I, I, I want you to connect the dots a bit and realize how relevant that story is for us today. The fire of the Holy Spirit is the fourth one and the final one, the fire of the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist said to the people and the, and the Pharisees, in Matthew 3, 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff. It's like burning away the dross. It's kind of a refiner's thing. It at least, it at least has that same ramifications. He will burn up, burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He he was talking about Jesus as the baptizer of the Holy Spirit here. And here's the fulfillment of what John the Baptist was saying in Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. I'm moving quick here because I want to give you a chance this morning and, and just get ready to open up your heart come forward to this altar. And I'm giving an altar call now. Why am I doing that? I'm getting you ready for it. At the end of service today, I'm gonna invite you to come forward for us all to cry out together for God to give us a fresh fire. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them like little single flames just, just came and it, and it rested on each of them. All, every person, all 120, all of them were then filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. That's Bible. That's what started the church. When they were praying in unity and they came together and they cried out to God, Lord, we, we, we know you promised us that you would send another and Here we are, day of Pentecost, boom, fulfillment of the promise. The Holy Spirit falls and they hear that that sound of a mighty rushing wind. It's like, I can't do it with this mic. But a big wind blows through. Those little flames of fire appear over everybody's head. And I think that's very significant. And then they begin to speak in other tongues. Oh, is this one of those tongue-talking churches? I don't believe in that stuff. Okay, well then tell me why it's in the Bible. It doesn't say we have to major on it all the time and and make our whole world revolve around that, but I'm telling you, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, being filled, being immersed in the Holy Spirit, in the person of the Holy Spirit, something happens when that, that happens. 
And one of the things it says here is that tongues come out of your mouth. Well, why would anybody speak in tongues? And this, this is not a message about tongues this morning. Why would anybody want to? Why, why would we need to do that? Why would God do that? I'll tell you why, because the worst thing or the biggest thing that gets in the way of our prayer life is this. What goes on between our ears? We start thinking. And if you can get to a place in your life where you realize that, that your brain is, isn't all that, that your ability to think and get your mind wrapped around things is not all that. But if you could shut this off and the Holy Spirit could pray through you words you don't understand, but words that come from the depths of your soul, syllables that come out, that's a heavenly language and it's a perfect prayer that the Holy Spirit is praying through you. Doesn't take your tongue and wag it. He's giving you the words, you are speaking them, and it's a perfect prayer unto God, and this don't get in the way. Man. That's what it is. Well, what a gift. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty intelligent, and uh, man, don't get your brain in the way. Let go. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. When the person of the Holy Spirit finally came this is what they were waiting for, by the way. They were in the upper room, waiting, praying, seeking God. This is what Jesus had promised them. He said, yeah, he, he had to go, but he would send another. This is the fulfillment of Jesus' promise. And his presence came again as that single flame of fire. We're talking about fire this morning, resting over the heads of everyone in that room. And, and I gotta tell you, remember that God is one, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three distinct personalities, the Godhead three in one, and we are on the other side of the cross. We don't live under the law anymore. We don't live before the time that the Holy Spirit was poured out on all flesh either. We live in the church age. That day of Pentecost started the church. We're still in this church age. That was the beginning of it. I think we're approaching the end of it. I think of the prophet Joel saying, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And what does it say? Your young men will what? Yeah, your young men, your old men will what? Your old men dream dreams, your young men will have visions, right? I think that's what it is, or maybe it's vice versa. It doesn't matter, it's being poured out on all flesh. The Holy Spirit. That Acts 2, 1, 4 was a fulfillment of that, but the end of the end of this age will be another fulfillment of that. And you can get into latter reign of the Holy Spirit and, and how he pours out in the last days and, and we could get into all that. But we are in the church age. It's a time of grace, a time where we as followers of Christ, imperfect as we are, can be forgiven of our sins through the cross and the sacrifice of Christ. It's a time where we can be filled with and baptized or immersed into the person of the Holy Spirit. He dwells within us. We have the opportunity to literally be the hands and feet of Jesus to those who need the gospel, to be his hands and feet because he lives inside of us, the Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul told us in Ephesians 5.18, hey, don't be drunk with wine. He said, don't be drunk with wine probably shouldn't be drunk with wine. Hey, don't get drunk with wine and booze and beer and all those things. I'm just gonna keep saying it until somebody says amen. Don't be drunk with wine, yeah. all right? Okay. <laughs> because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that word filled there is literally to be continually filled, to be in a state of perpetual filling. In other words, one-time filling doesn't check the box of what Paul was telling us here. It's not a one time and you're done. There is an initial time and that's important. But we need a fresh fire of the Holy Spirit, a fresh filling of in every moment of every day, of every month, and every month of every year of our lives. And, and let me share with you some thoughts that I had as I was studying all of this and, and maybe it will help you, again, connect the dots in, these, in, in all these types of fires that the Bible talks about. Are you still with me this morning? The sacrifices that were consumed by the holy fire in the Old Testament were awesome displays of God's power. 
But the living sacrifices that we can be for him are also awesome displays of God's power. We can be living sacrifices consumed by his fire, on fire for him, because Jesus died once and for all. He died for our sin. That's all paid for, done, and we can be on fire for him. And let me, sh- and, and uh, the uh, Romans 12, one and two, I'm gonna read that. And so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Just as the acceptable sacrifices of old were consumed by holy fire, we as living sacrifices are accepted because of the blood of Jesus and can be consumed by the fire of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of connections here. The the fire of the Holy Spirit is also a refiner's type fire. We become more like Jesus when his Holy Spirit has filled us. Did you know that? Jesus told his disciples, John 14, 16, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. Some versions say helper. Some versions say comforter. Who will never leave you? He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. The world cannot receive him because he doesn't look for him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him, but you know him because he lives with you and now you now and later will be in you. It's talking about the day of Pentecost and for us today. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. The fire of the Holy Spirit refines us to look more like Jesus. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You can't be a witness if you look more like the world than you look like Jesus. He refines us Talking about the Holy Spirit here, the, Holy, the fire of the Holy Spirit refines us and conforms us into the image of his glory. We must just be willing vessels, like malleable clay in his hands that he can shape and mold into whatever he wants. And let's be real. When we allow the consuming fire of the Holy Spirit to fall on us fresh every day, we won't be like those who live in their sin and will one day fall under God's fire of judgment. We escape that as we humbly come to Christ in salvation and allow the fire of his Holy Spirit to rest in our lives. He keeps us and preserves us. Ephesians 1.13 says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. We're sealed in him. I wanna invite the worship team to come up right now if they would. And there, there, there are so many layers to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and and how it connects to the fire that consumes sacrifices and how it connects to the refiner's fire and even the fire of judgment that's mentioned in the word of God. And this is what what I I want you to do this morning. Would you just close your eyes and pray with me today? And if the Holy Spirit is, I guess my heart is this. If, If the Holy Spirit is available to pour out his flesh or his fresh, sorry, fresh fire upon me, if he's willing to do that, then I want it all. Light that match and let it burn. Let the fire burn out all the dross in my life. Refine me, Lord. I want to be a reflection of you. Let me be a living sacrifice consumed by the fire of the Holy Spirit. It's a new year, Lord, and I want a fresh fire. I want to receive that power as you fill me, Holy Spirit. Power to be a witness for your name's sake. Power to flow in your manifestations gift, manifestation gifts. Holy Spirit, I want to be led by you like that pillar of fire led the Israelites in the wilderness. I want to be a burning, living sacrifice for your glory. I know Jesus has paid for everything, but I don't want to be a sacrifice that costs me nothing. Let it cost me my pride. At least that, Lord. 
I don't want to just smolder and smoke like a fire that can't decide what it's going to do in almost fire, whose who smoke blinds people and repels them away from the truth. I want to be ablaze. I want to be so on fire that I become a picture of your light in this dark world. Like the face of Moses, give me a fresh fire and let me reflect your glory, O oh God. This world is tough, church. Our mission is tough. To be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world and to build his kingdom until he comes again, it's tough. And without the fire of the Holy Spirit, without his fresh fire being poured into our lives, it becomes impossible. Going over a lot of scripture this morning. Fire of God's judgment, refining fire, the fire that burns the sacrifice, the fire of the Holy Spirit, talked about others. But, but, but really the crux of all of it is this. Do you want a fresh fire from the Lord? To carry out the purposes and plans that he has for you in this new year and the years to come. Thanks for being a part of the Indianola First podcast. Join us next week to stay updated on our latest messages.